Hey everyone, today I'm going to show you how to get the Invector third person camera working with Photon Bolt. Um, first of all, I'm going to just explain some of the basics about uh, the networking in, um, in Bolt and basically what I had to do in order to get this working. Um, I did follow the Bolt 101 uh, in one of my previous videos. I'll put a link in the description. I used kind of an off-the-shelf UI system for now, so it's just kind of a proof of concept um, where I can hit play and I can hit multiplayer. And right now I'm just going to start a server and it creates a third-person uh, controller and you're actually able to network this. Um, so I could have uh, another instance of this running. So now I've got two instances of the game running. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click multiplayer on both of them, uh, start server on one, and then join server on the other. And I'm going to start typing in um, if I can if I can get it to recognize my input here. Oh, there we go. Oh, I had I had my numlock. So um, I'm actually going to do um, 192.168.0.7. Is it this guy over here? Yeah, so you can see that they are networked together. Uh, the actions are synced between the two. They can't really fight each other. They don't do damage to each other, which is fine. Uh, that's normally what happens in these kinds of situations. So um, I'm going to show you how that works. So the first thing is um, that we have this UI. You know, this is a single player only scene. Um, this is not the same scene that you're gonna have multiple players on simultaneously. It could be a copy of that other scene, but it wouldn't be the same scene. Those buttons have on click events on them. Um, it just so happens that all of my on click events are pointing to the same object with the same script on it because I consolidated all of my UI functions to a single script which is um, something that I highly recommend that you do. Um, and I called it main menu controller and it has all the different methods on it that my buttons can do. The start server um, is going to be this button here, but then the join server is actually gonna be on the connect menu. Um, so that menu is over here. Uh, you type in your IP address and then you hit this button here um, so this will then take the text from that IP address um, and then start the client. Um, so that's, that's how you do that. Um, but uh, that by itself, it is really just going to not do anything useful. Um, so you actually need one more script that's completely separate from this um, that's going to handle all of the other Bolt stuff. Um, and, and in that case, I called it networking menu callbacks. Um, these, these classes, it's, it's kind of a, a weird way that this is all set up. Um, there, there's a good reason for it, but it is kind of weird. In order for me to um, do this smoothly or be able to, to, to create this multiplayer system smoothly, I have to know when Bolt is ready to start accepting things. Um, and, and this is the system that they use for um, informing your program when it's ready, because it's an asynchronous process. It, it runs in the background. So we, we have to be, it has to tell us when it's ready to start working. Um, so that's why these callbacks are necessary. Um, and uh, we have a bolt start done down here where we're checking, you know, if I'm the client, then I connect to the server, simple as that. Um, else, if I'm the server, then I'm gonna load a certain scene. Um, so this scene, um, in my case, I called it LAN, but it's really just the name of the scene. Um, and you'll notice if I open up my build settings here, um, you know, I've got my main menu and my LAN uh, here. These are the only two things. The main menu is the first scene in the build. The LAN is the second one. Um, and the only thing the main menu does is it, it just basically opens the scene or connects to a client um, is really all it does. The way that all this is built, you can find different examples of this throughout the Bolt documentation. We load this other scene here. And what's the next thing that happens after that? So we go to the networking game callbacks. Um, so that's actually gonna be on the other scene. So we're gonna have to open up the other scene to take a look at that. And so this is the scene. Um, this scene doesn't have any characters on it. It is completely void of anything except for just static assets. There's nothing dynamic here whatsoever. What we're gonna do with this is we're gonna take a player and spawn it here somewhere. And in order to do that, we have this game networking callbacks uh, that I that I had mentioned earlier 
where we're basically going to um, instantiate our bolt object and uh, in, w w as an added bonus we're also going to instantiate a hostile AI, uh, some kind of enemy that we're going to fight. Um, so um, I've also got something extra here um, because in my game I want there to also be a networked VR player um, so you can be just a normal player or you can be a VR player and a VR player obviously is going to have a different camera rig and lots of other differences so this this player here will support mobile um, and it supports desktop uh, with like a keyboard and mouse um, and I believe the same build also supports um, other controller types as well so I believe it also uh, supports uh, game pads um, but the VR obviously only works for VR um, and then our hostile AI is the same no matter what um, we always have the same AI so the interesting thing about networking though is that the instance of the object that you want to be seen if you're the server is different from the object that you want to be seen by the client so if I'm hosting a server, my character can be controlled by me. My character can be controlled by my keyboard, by my mouse, and by other actions that I take. But someone who has their own character, they can't control mine. So if they use their keyboard and their mouse, it controls their character, but it doesn't control mine. So the scripts that need to be attached to those characters have to be different. Otherwise, one person's keyboard and mouse is going to control all the network characters that are on the scene, and that wouldn't be the right thing at all. Um, and so what I did in that situation, I tried to follow a, a convention with it. I have um, an object that's real, an object that's a replica, and an object that chooses between the two. What I have is this basic game object. All it is, I can drag it onto the scene here and we can take a close look at it and um, you can see that it's absolutely nothing. Um, in fact, it's this actually rather stupid decal that's visible even in game mode, um, which is really bizarre. I haven't figured out a way to turn that off yet, so if you know how to turn that off, let me know. There is a tutorial that you can follow on the Bolt 101, 102, 103 on their website. Um, that kind of explains the basics behind state um, but I'll show you how I have mine set up um, so if we go over to the bolt assets tab here um, which is really important uh, for doing anything in bolt is to understand assets um, and to be able to edit uh, states using the bolt editor um, but basically what I did uh, was I deleted out all the default stuff that's in here and I basically just created my own state my own player state um, and my own VR player state, which is a little bit different. Um, it has a left hand, right hand, whereas the actual player state is, is quite a bit different. And I'll explain how all this works. Um, so basically with the uh, player state, this is data that we want to transfer between different parties that are playing a game. So different people that are playing a game together. Um, this, is, this is data that we want to transmit and keep in sync between everyone who's playing the game. So one thing that, that we definitely want to do is we want to know the position of every player who's playing. Um, and so in a lot of the tutorials that you'll see for Bolt, um, they, this is what they use. They use the transform to replicate the position of an object from server and client. Um, but this by itself isn't very useful. Um, and so what you really need on top of this is you also need mechanism uh, duplication. Um, so there's, for, for this player state here, um, I've been able to um, uh, generate all of these fields uh, for the mechanism um, by simply taking my uh, runtime animator controller and dropping it here and then clicking import, which is a button that comes up. You can find a tutorial of this. Um, so in this case, um, I'm always using the Invector Melee Combat V3 um, because that's what I have. Um, and that's what I want to use in the game. Um, and that's what you saw earlier with me using my keyboard and mouse to control the character and move them around and attack and all that kind of stuff. But it also had support for mobile. Basically just take all the fields from that animator controller and it would import them here. Um, and the only thing that doesn't work that I've seen so far is the rolling. So rolling is not replicated, but I think that'll be an easy fix. I think we just have to add a trigger for that. Um, and we should be able to replicate rolling that way. So um, I had to make what's called a behavior. 
uh, in Bolt, um, and this behavior will actually instantiate the Bolt entity, you can, you can say. Um, this is where we're actually choosing between the real version and the fake version, depending on if I'm the owner of this object versus not the owner. Um, so uh, let's take a look at that script. And so you can see here that I've um, injected a few variables uh, from the inspector. Um, in the inspector, all of these have a value and I'll show you what they are. Um, the first one is the real version, whichever party created that entity over the network. So whichever one actually instantiated that entity, um, they will get the real version. If we are the owner of the entity, then we do something different. Um, so camera, so in my case, um, the camera was different. A VR camera is built into the player rig. We have a UI component. Um, again, the UI component would potentially change between mobile versus desktop. So uh, we may have multiple of these in the future. And then this is the replica. So this is the version that everyone else sees who's not the owner. Um, and then these two lines of code down here are very, very important because you're basically saying that um, this player transform, the, the transform that we put, which is this one here to track the state of the player, um, we want to basically take the instance of whatever it is we created, whether it was the real or the replica, we're going to tie these two things together. Um, so if I'm the owner, then I am demanding what the transform ought to be. And if I'm the client, then I'm reading what the transform is and applying that on my local copy of the object. And, that, and that's what this state does automatically. Um, and then the animator, we do the exact same thing. And this is to replicate the animation of the mechanism controller um, over the network. Um, but it doesn't pull in everything. It only pulls in mechanism. Uh, so anything that you do on top of that, like inverse kinematics or something along those lines, um, that kind of stuff would have to be replicated differently. Um, and, and that's pretty much it with, with this class here. Um, it basically just chooses between real and replica, and, um, and that's pretty much it. So as you can see, we have a working uh, third-person controller. If you try to attack a, a, uh, an AI, you'll notice that they act differently. So this one here that's chasing me, this one is one that I own. So this is the real version of the, uh, of the AI. But if I go to this one over here, this one's the replica. And you'll notice that it acts different. Um, oh, crap. If I hit this one, he acts differently. He just kind of stands there. The other guy was following me. This guy just stands here. Um, and, and he knows that I'm here, and he'll try to attack me. Should be, should be fixable. But otherwise, it does seem to work for the most part. I also had it working on mobile, so they definitely cross platforms. And I even had the same exact setup working in VR, too. But anyway, I hope this helped out. If you have any questions, let me know. And uh, if you have any comments, leave them. Thanks.